This time I'm taking a look at a Japanese Yakuza film from the 1970s, and the first part of the Yakuza Papers, or Battle Without Honor or Humanity series of films, titled appropriately, the Yakuza Papers in the U.S., or Battle Without Honor or Humanity in Japan. Let's get one thing out of the open early. This is an exploitation film. It's all about showing the lurid and exciting world of the Yakuza, one that's seductive and dangerous, with intrigue and violence and death lurking around every turn. No one is safe, and the only future you can look forward to is a bloody death. So the only question is how successful and well-off will you be when you die? The film follows the formation of the Yamamori Yakuza family in post-war Hiroshima, with the emphasis on the post-war, as the film starts in 1946. As the film goes on, the Yakuza family starts to fall apart as greed, paranoia, and ambition turns each of the founding members against each other, and they pick each other off one at a time. With the film's protagonist, Shozo Hirono, played very well by Bunta Sugawara, trying to maintain his honor and his loyalty to his friends throughout. Director Kinji Fukasaku uses a very dynamic camera throughout the film, with tight zooms and a shaky camera giving a sense of claustrophobia and confusion as the film goes on. And the leads, particularly Hirono and his brothers-in-arms Tatsuya Sakai, played by Hiroki Matsukakara, and Shinichi Yamagata, played by Kenji Takamiya, start wondering who they can trust, or if they can trust anyone at all. However, this leads to the film's main problem, the acting. The cast of the film is full of actors who play great tough guys. Their heart is nails and tougher than a one dollar or hundred yen steak. That's also the only emotion they're really good at expressing. Whenever they're expressing any weak emotion, like sorrow or fear, they play it to an extreme. They play the extreme poorly. In scenes where they're playing distraught and they're sobbing, it's like if they were acting in English, you'd probably hear them literally saying, boo-hoo. Now, for some actors, this can be appealing. Hell, this is part of the reason behind the popularity of some of Nicolas Cage's more intensely acted roles. However, part of what makes that work makes that work for the cage is that when he's acting that intensely, his characters are feeling the full emotional range that intensely. When they're distraught, they're utterly heartbroken. When they're angry, they're in a white hot rage. There's no middle ground. And thus the extremes make sense. The actors in this film though, when they're in tough guy mode, which they are for about three quarters of the film, are calm, cool, and collected. They are stoic, and they are relaxed in the face of danger. When they do lose their cool, it's usually into rage, which also fits the characters. It's macho to be angry, and these characters are meant to be incredibly macho. But when those actors need to show a less macho emotion, like fear or sorrow, there's a strong sense of whiplash. Fortunately, these scenes do not come up often, which actually makes these occurrences more off, more jarring and off-putting. The film has one other significant flaw. It just covers too much material in too short a time. The film runs for 90 minutes and covers about a decade, taking the plot from 1945, 1946, to 1955 and 1956. And it sets up a lot of characters for planned sequels, in addition to characters who are only in this film and whose actions or demise, exist to set up future events in later films, and set up events which mold the characters in this film. This means you have a lot of characters, but you don't have enough time to really establish these characters on screen, or give them any depth before they're gone. I can't help but feel that this film would have been better served as an 8 to 12 episode television series, with hour long episodes, as opposed to a 90 minute film. That would give the story and characters more room to breathe, as opposed to having to pack a decade's worth of narrative into 90 minutes of screen time. I can understand why they did it, and certainly they couldn't have gotten away with the bre breadth of the material that we have in this film, and the type of material covered. Like, honestly, in terms of having this type of content in the television series, you probably couldn't have gotten away with it until the advent of basic, uh, not even basic cable, but like premium channels like HBO in the United States. I can imagine things being similar in Japan, at least until direct video direct video series started coming about. Still, having more pacing, having more breadth of, sto of story to tell would have absolutely benefited the story and this film a lot more. 
Next time, we continue the series with part two, Deadly Fight in Hiroshima. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.